Every Christian is caught up in a great battle. It's a battle between good and evil, between God and Satan. But so few of us understand this battle. Today, we'll discuss the nature of spiritual warfare and what that means for each of us with Dave Van Vickel. Dave is a director of evangelization for two large parishes in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Dave has also been assisting priests in their ministry of exorcism and deliverance for many years. I'm Father Dave Pavanka, TOR, President of Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, and you're watching Franciscan University Presents. Stay with us. Franciscan University Presents. I'm your host, Father Dave Pavanka, TUR, President of Franciscan University of Steubenville. And today we'll be talking about spiritual warfare. I'm joined with our panelists, Dr. Regis Martin, a theology professor here at Franciscan University. Welcome. And Dr. Scott Hahn, the Father Michael Scanlon Professor of Biblical Theology in the New Evangelization here at Franciscan University. But our special guest today is Mr. Dave Van Vickel. Dave graduated in 2006. 2006. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dave's been a real great friend of mine for many, many years, and it's just a blessing to have him with us. Dave is a minister in a couple of parishes in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He's got a lot of years of ministry, but specifically for our conversation today, he has been ministering with priests, doing deliverance and, and exorcism ministry for the last many years. Right. How does one get involved in that, Dave? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like a who, who you know kind of a thing. I just happened to you know, yeah. ha have a priest uh, friend who was an official exorcist, and, he, um, and I started to assist him. And this was a long time ago. And then in 1998, I think it was 1998, Pope John Paul sent out a letter saying that, you know, dioceses need to start appointing exorcists. Well, people were scrambling because no one know, knew how to do it. You know, we let the practice really almost fall out of existence in America. So every time I would move, you know, I would start assisting other priests and helping other priests because most of, most of them were doing it cold. They had never been to one before and didn't know what to expect. So I started doing that. I don't currently assist with official ministry. I'm more involved in the academic side okay. and I speak about it all over the country. So. That's right. I remember one time you shared with me, you could give a talk on a saint or something like that and 10 people will come. And yet you go to a place and you're gonna have a talk on demons and deliverance and the place is packed. Yeah. Why yeah. do you think that is? Well, I, well, for one thing, the culture is, it's the vogue topic in the culture, like in the, even in you know, secular culture, uh, you know, as, cult, as the culture becomes more atheist, a cult rises, a cult activity yeah. rises yeah. as well. It's a strange phenomenon. And so people are obsessed with this and they wanna hear about it. And they associate the Catholic Church with exorcism. I mean, it's it's right. a massive right. bridge of trust, you know. Right. So, and yeah. it is true, you know. I, I go, and most priests think that no one's going to come to this talk. Right. And right. I say, right. you're not setting up enough chairs. You're not setting up enough chairs. Yeah. And and they're like, no, just trust me. No one comes to talks. But it's so you're not really the attraction. Uh, right. The devil is. Right. Yeah. Right. right. Do you need a close acquaintance uh, with evil <laughs> uh, to be an expert in this realm? Uh, uh, obviously not. I think it's more a close acquaintance with the opposite side. You know, when you are in, involved in this ministry, you do see some impressive feats of evil, but more than anything, you see the power of God, the victory of Christ, particularly through the priesthood. It's a, it's the, right. it's a great way to look at the priesthood yeah. uh, because it's so physical. And may, maybe just talk about this. So we, we use the language like uh, kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God, the kingdom of, of his presence. Maybe just speak to that, this, this idea that, I think we've got strange ideas in our culture about the evil one, like there's a good, uh, right. a good you know, that whole red and black right. and all that kind of right. thing. So maybe just speak to the nature of spiritual sure. warfare and, and these two kingdoms that are colliding. So traditionally, right, or classically, the church would say that spiritual warfare is the battle of a Christian between the world, the flesh, and the devil. And in this very intense way, like through the ministry of exorcism, we see that battle with the devil. And very clearly you see in the fathers of the church that they saw the world as two kingdoms. There's no question, right? And they saw it very much that while Jesus Christ came to heal, teach, and save, he also came to conquer and he also came to establish this kingdom. And you see that kingdom being uh, played out through the propagation of the faith, through the propagation of the church. And everything about the Catholic church 
screams that it's claiming people for its right. kingdom right. and will defend that claim. And you know, uh, it's a beautiful thing. I, I like the way the Catholic Church approaches it in a way that is not sensationalizing, right. you know, because, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, as you said, you know, an unofficial exorcist, there were no official right. exorcists. Right. John Paul really sort of renewed this ministry that is ancient in the church right. and an office as such, too. But the idea that a lot of people are coming out to see you or to hear sure. about this doesn't surprise me because while we can relegate it to sensationalism, I think people have a gut sense that this is not, that this is realism, right. that there is no other way to explain the chaos of our world apart from evil that goes beyond being in the wrong political party. Right. You know? And the catechism does not usually indulge in hyperbole, but the phrase that I found that was so curious was dour spiritual combat. You know, it's like right. since the dawn of history, right. you know, we go back and we didn't just make a wrong turn in the garden. I mean, we really entered into a covenant with death, with the prince right. of death and the kingdom of darkness. And this is not just sort of like a symbolic thing that we project onto the world to make sense out of evil. This is something that is lurking, but also powerful. Yeah. You know, there's intelligence so. and malevolence. So. Yeah. Yeah. In, the, in C.S. Lewis's uh, classic work, right. the uh, screw tape letters, I mean, outwardly, it's sort of amusing, this charming guy, uh, uh, Uncle Wormwood, uh, or, but really it's blood curdling uh, right. battle. And Lewis makes the point, I, I think, in introducing this work, that there are two opposite yet equally erroneous views about the devil. One is to say he doesn't exist, right. which is really to play into the hands of the evil one. The other is to be sort of morbidly uh, right. and obsessively fixated upon the devil right. and to imagine that he and God are really slugging it out together right. as if there's a certain parity right. between the two. The devil is a creature. Right. He's, he's no closer to God than you are. He doesn't create. He can't make anything. He can't make things bad because he doesn't have that capacity. Right, right, right. And, so and, don't yeah, take him too seriously. Right, there can be right. no comparison. And the problem with the movies, which is where most people are getting their catechesis on the devil, is from the movies. Yeah, it, just so that's not the best place. Right, yeah, that's <laughs> right. Uh, in the movies, you have this battle between priest and demon, priest and demon, who's going to win? It, that is nothing like my experience of exorcism. Yeah. Yeah. Demons are terrified of priests, absolutely terrified. Yeah. They know that the priest represents an end an end to their reign. They Except know. maybe the priest who's a little bit skeptical. Right, who might, or, or might, yeah, might be afraid right. or might not understand that fully. But it absolutely is the case that you see, yeah, some, some power of, of the devil, but more than anything, you see an incredible power yeah. given to the church. Yeah. Just to that end, though, the spectrum that Regis was talking about, um, don't believe he doesn't exist or too much. Where do you find most of the people you're dealing with? I mean, are this, they aware of this battle that they're involved in? They're, they're, uh, they're aware. So, so last year, I, I have one talk that I give all over the country, about 10,000 people came to this event throughout different spots. And it is clear to me that they are aware of an existence of a spiritual battle and they feel entirely and completely helpless because we don't talk about it. Most priests who are good priests who believe in the devil will say like, I don't want to focus on that. Let's not focus on that. And what you have to say to them is, well, it's not fair. It's not fair to them because your people don't have the formation that you have. They don't know what you know. And, and it's a big part of our tradition. You, sure, read, you, know, you read anything from before Vatican II, it's filled with words like spiritual combat, okay. spiritual right. warfare. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, but what is, like, what is the lived experience? You use spiritual warfare. The average person in the pew, I mean, how, how does this engage them? How are they a part of that? Well, it's, it's clear that um, m most people are coming from extremely broken families, broken issues at, at, at uh, the people they interact with. They see and they feel helpless at the fact that their children are being taken by the world in a very serious okay. and real sense, and they don't know what to do. And right. they don't know that the devil has a part in that. Now, it's, you know, it's like you said, we're not going to say that the devil's around every corner, but they clearly have no clue how to deal with it. Okay, this. real quick, because I think that's an important point. You use the word, the world, the flesh, and the devil, that maybe say a word or two about that, that there's a way that we say that we don't take any responsibility of the flesh, right? Right. And how that works in. So maybe a word about that. Right. I mean, they all work together. That's basically, you know, the, the situation we find ourselves is that because of sin, uh, you kind of put it perfectly that we, we entered into a covenant with death Right? The world, the flesh, and the devil are all working against us to draw us away from God. And they all have ways of 
claiming us and yeah. the church has her way of claiming us back from them. Amen. And uh, it's, it, you'll, you'll see the kingdom of God grow in a person through personal holiness, right? And so it's through fighting all three of those things in, in different ways, but in, in nuanced ways, but mostly you just see a person becoming holier and holier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's clear they're gaining victory. Well, our I, I culture think, today, I think, is such a broad spectrum, as you said, and you were pointing out, you know, screw tape letters. And yeah. the, um, the, the fact is, people assume that you can be neutral, you know, right. like, like Switzerland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, when in fact, this sort of moral relativism that just says, well, look, I'm not going to, ignores the fact that, you know, when you're born with original sin, you were born in the dominion of darkness, as right. Paul told the Ephesians. You know, when you're, when you're born in postmodern Western culture, you're ba basically taught that the world is a playground, when in fact, it's a battleground. Right. And the, the other thought that strikes me too is that with the prevailing moral relativism that hangs over us like a thick cloudy day, you know, people invariably get on planes and realize, wait, there's something above the clouds. And that light shows people, I think, that you know, you can't really be a spiritual pacifist. Right. You know, that there is a war and you've got to take sides. You can't go to Normandy and see the Nazis and the, and the Canadians, the Americans and the British and say, let's celebrate diversity. There's war going right, right, on, right, right. you know. And the prize is, is our soul. The prize it, is, right. is it, the soul it, of the individual. It, it, real clearly, I just recently was talking to someone who's having some issues in their home, uh, demonic manifestations in their home. And I said to them, you know, the problem is, that, you know, their, their comment to me was, I think I'd rather just not stir this up. Let's not enter oh, the engage yeah, the yeah. battle. I think I'd rather just remain to neutral. Live with it. And I, yeah, yeah, right. right exactly. And I had to say, well, make no mistake, it's not that you're being neutral. If they're not doing anything, if they're not manifesting, it's because they think they have you. That's right. right. You're this complicit. Yeah, the battle is over. Yeah. Right. I think You've to, lost. to bear in mind, though, is in one of my experiences has been people who say, well, I, you know, I've never been involved in the cult. I never did Ouija boards or anything like that, as if that's the only way. So maybe speak to that, that it's not just that act of participation, but everybody is born into this. Yeah, we're, uh, so we're all, every single, not all people are going to need an exorcism, but every single person needs the victory that Jesus won on the cross Amen. to be realized in their own life. We will not get to heaven without that, right? The point is, is that a cult activity is such a small little minuscule part, but the world, the flesh, and the devil Absolutely. are using other things right. in much more profound ways. So people will ask me at these talks, well, what do you think about Harry Potter? I don't, I don't let my 12-year-old son watch Harry Potter. And I say, well, did your 12-year-old son have a smartphone? And they say, oh yeah. And I say, good luck. Good luck with that, right? <laughs> right. The devil's using phones more than anything right now. You know, he's but just isn't a, the rite of exorcism inscribed in, in the ceremony of baptism? Right. It's part oh, of, of course, the, uh, of the ritual. Right. Uh, the trouble, I think, often arises uh, when people confuse the two realms. On the one hand, there's creation, which is good, but then there's the whole drama of the fall, which right. is not so good. Right. Uh, and the the task of asceticism, self-mastery, is that you discipline yourself because you're in the world, but you don't wish to be of the world. But at no point do you pronounce the world bad. It's a good place to be, but it has been perverted right. by the evil one. Uh, right. And we must stand tall in the saddle. Yeah. And it helps to have St. Michael uh, the Archangel yeah. Yeah, right. as a I, companion in arms. I think an important point to what you're saying is, yeah, the, the baptism ritual has exorcism within it. And what I want people to understand is that every bit of the church has that idea of claim in it, right? That they're claiming us. Every right, every but The old tradition. form does. I right. mean, the sure. short form doesn't, right. and that's right. used as much or more. Right, unfortunately. Yeah. Right. But don't we also see that what you said, this claiming, isn't that part of what Jesus' ministry is? When we take a look at the scripture, don't we see Jesus claiming the person back, the individual back, that this is his product? So the scriptures are evident that, that Jesus yeah. was coming no to question. in order to engage that world. Right. There is a sense, though, in which we're still vulnerable. You know, it's like sure. that house sure. that has an evil spirit and it's swept, and everything's put in order, but it isn't filled right. with the spirit. Right of holiness, and so seven worse than the first, you know. Right. And when our Lord gives us that parable, it's a warning to his own generation, but also to ours. Yeah. Of course. That, uh, you know, you don't just kind of spring cleaning. Right. You've got to sustain this for an entire life. I, I think we're seeing that right now in the well, church, right? Well, when you right? think we're of St. Mary Magdalene, for example, who is an icon right. of conversion, right. I mean, she was assailed by what, seven demons? Right. And then she's the first witness right. to the right. resurrection. But I don't think she ever rested on her laurels. No. I mean, she remained vigilant right to the end. The, the, I mean, the devil would want her more than anybody else. Sure. Yeah, yeah and, that, and you see that uh, in, 
every single life of the saints, particularly in female mystics, you see this kind of amazing relationship between the female mystics and, and the devil that right to the very end, there's this battle that's going to take place right. and that they're preparing for that final battle even, you know, but it never really, they never rest, you know, yeah. even on their deathbed, you'll see <laughs> comments made about, you know, well, I have another reason to turn to God's mercy. Right. Well, Therese, the little flower, right. who's tormented by the worst temptations to atheism sure. in the last weeks and hours sure. of her life. Sure. Yeah. And that's important, is that this battle is continual, that, that we need to be uh, attentive, aware, never feel like we're kind of out of the woods with that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think the, the message to, to us is that you, you're, you're never going to rest in this battle. It's not going to work this side of the grave, you know. But, and then we really become more aware of that, that it's not about being overwhelmed or frightened or anything like that, but being attentive to it. Yeah, absolutely. It, I, I don't think that anybody who's experienced an intense form of the spiritual battle is necessarily frightened. I think that what they're more, it's like an awakening where right. they say, oh my goodness, this is real. And it's real in, in a way that I never really realize. Uh -huh. And a lot of parts of the church kind of come alive at that moment because they think, this is why the church says this. This is why St. Michael was taught when I was little. Exactly. This is why our guardian angels. Exactly. That's great. We have so much more to talk about, so stay with us. And Franciscan University Presents continues. Since baptism signifies liberation from sin and from its instigator, the devil, one or more exorcisms are pronounced over the candidate. The celebrant then anoints him with the oil of catechumens or lays his hands on him, and he explicitly renounces Satan. Thus prepared, he is able to confess the faith of the church to which he will be entrusted by baptism. Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 1237. When God created you, he made you like no other person. You are unique, singular, and unrepeatable. So shouldn't your college experience be the same? At Franciscan University of Steubenville, you'll find faith and reason, wisdom and grace, mercy and truth. You'll study under world-class scholars and seasoned practitioners who are committed to Christ and His church. With over 40 majors and pre-professional programs, you'll find the formation you need to succeed. You'll discover lifelong friends and mentors who will welcome you, challenge you, and encourage you. Because we believe as Catholics, we are not called to hide from culture, but transform it. At Franciscan University, you'll find more than just a college. You'll find yourself and an educational experience as singular as you are. Back to Franciscan University presents. We're talking about spiritual warfare with Dave Van Vickel. And uh, Dave, you mentioned earlier about the, kind of this idea in the movies that they always go to the Catholic priest or go to the Catholic Church or something like that. Is there a particularly Catholic way or, or way of talking or dealing with spiritual warfare? Sure. So you know, I've brought up a few times that word claim, right? Uh, claim. You know, I would see it as like that 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 soteriological principle that the Church stands on when it takes a person into her and then has the rights and the grace necessary to defend that claim on on their life and every bit of the catholic church reflects that you know all of the different rites and traditions reflect that and so uh, we also have a very well developed theology of exorcism which other faiths do not have as much right, right. you know c compared to the catholic church and it's just traditionally, culturally, priests are kind of known as like, you know, what do you do when you, something goes bump in the night, you call a priest or something like that. And so it's a major bridge of trust to our right, culture right. because they associate it with that. Right. Right. You know, the etymology of exorcism, I think, is interesting because in the Greek, ex horkidzo, horkos, that term is the Greek word for oath. Right. And oath is what you do that's different than a promise. And a promise, I give you my word, my word is my name. But in an oath, you invoke the holy name of God, right, right. you know, and our help is in the name of right. the Lord who made heaven and earth. And this isn't just pious rhetoric, right. you know, this isn't just religious tradition. There is something about invoking the name of God that binds. Right. Sure. Curiously, the Latin word for oath is sacramentum. Right. And I don't think it's a coincidence 
because the sacraments all possess exorcistic power, yeah. whatever you bind on right. earth and so on. And so, you know, the, the Greek form of oathing out, right. you know, invoking the name of God and then releasing the power of God to deliver is a reminder that, you know, we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Because God is at work in us to will and do for his good pleasure, Philippians 2, 12 and 13. But, you know, if you don't have God working in you, right. then, you know, you're on a, at the you, you embrace despair justifiably until you do invoke that name of God. Yeah. And there we find our refuge. And, and as you said, right. in, in the Catholic Church, that, that this invoking, this calling out is from the very beginning. Baptism, I mean, when you ta pay attention to the baptismal rite, there's an exorcism part of that rite that is claiming this child now belongs to God, that there is a new reality that's taking place with this child. Well, we can learn, the, the deep theology of this is the fact that the reason why a priest is an exorcist is because he has in persona Christi, right. the character of the priesthood. Right. And that's something for all of us to learn because uh, I don't have in persona Christi, right? That doesn't mean I'm helpless against the devil. What it means is that I enter into Christ. That's how I gain my victory. Right. Whereas the priest can do that through office, I can do that through holiness. Right. Right. Yeah, I don't think we can uh, stress that enough, right. that there is this objective uh, charism or quality or character of, of holiness, and it, 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 it functions independent of the moral standing of the agent, the priest. Right. Uh, I mean, I can't go to my wife to get exorcised, even if right. she may be holier <laughs> than any priest I know. Sure. It's got to be a priest, uh, ex opere operato, by virtue of, of the work performed, something happens. Right. Sure. At, yeah. Well, but to that end, so we, we clear that the priest is involved with the exorcism, but it's not merely exorcism. There's other levels, right. if you will. So maybe speak to that. that sure, right. Uh, again, I think exorcism gets all the attention, but that's actually really rare, isn't it? It's extremely rare. Yeah. What's not rare is the fact that we're all in a battle every right, single absolutely. day. All absolutely. of us are. And all of us, through our baptism, have some kind of authority over evil. Which gives, at baptism, we are baptized priest, prophet, and king. Of so course. Okay, so There's so. no question. And we're meant to live in that, and we're meant to do that. The authority over evil comes, first and foremost, from holiness. Holiness. And this is why you see the incredible relationship between the saints and the devil, right? That, in a certain sense, their holiness is, you know, has the kingdom of God spilling forth from them and the devil doesn't like it. And so you yeah. see that response. Sure. So the way that a lay person gains authority is through holiness, communion with God. That's and the it, key it, though, right there. Right, it, there's no question. Holiness is not to be confused with ethical rectitude. No, no. Being no, right. good, you know. No, right. Holiness is really a being possessed by the Holy Spirit. And in that, I mean, I'm, I'm in total agreement with you. Right. But I think that's why we need to see that, yes, the priest acting in persona Christi Capita is the key, but it isn't a competitive sort of thing. No. You know, we are subordinate to the priests. We are part of the church. It isn't church and state, it's clergy and laity, right. but one hand washing the other. Right. And so if we unite ourselves in faith, hope, and love, then our baptisms empower us to function as dads in our own family as a domestic church. I've used holy water sure. thousands of times, not only on my kids, but on their doorposts as well, sure. and praying the prayers with them, but also for them. And there really are so many things that we can do in union with the priest, in communion with Christ. I, I love that because, you know, the, the truth is that an exorcist is an exorcist because of a letter that exists, right. where the bishop is basically right. saying, I lend my apostolic authority for this. Oh. Why? Because you want that priest to walk in, not just on the holiness of Father Dave, but the entire church walks into the, the room with him. The, church, the, whole, yeah. the whole, you know, treasury of our faith is brought to bear on that evil attachment. And this is what's beautiful, is that you can enter into that through office. We enter into that through the communion of saints. That's right. We can enter into that and become more Catholic, in a sense, and receive more of that power, that authority. You, you've used the, spoken to the saints a couple of times, and I think there's this false perception that says, okay, the holier you become, the more closer you come to the Lord, then you don't have to deal with that anymore. But in <laughs> fact, it's quite the opposite, isn't it? Absolutely. You, do you have some examples of saints yeah, that... Right. So, I mean, you, you clearly see this in the lives of almost every saint, you know, writes about it, but we whitewash their stories. But St. Gemma Golgani would be like the perfect example of a saint that God literally, it almost seems put on this earth 
for the specific reason of fighting the evil one. Uh -huh. uh, a lot of the female mystics are like that. Uh, St. John Vianney as well is another one who was constantly battered. Right. And Padre, Padre, Padre Pio, Pio yeah. would be a, would be a But you know, yeah. this is not something, we're naming a lot of modern saints or relatively recent ones. But you go back to the, you know, the fourth century and you know, when St. Athanasius conquers Arius and Arianism, you know, he writes the life of St. Anthony. It's like, what is that, a diversion? No, no. His point is that while St. Anthony was in the cave praying, you know, as a recluse, as a hermit, he was being thrown around the cave. So his prayer, his fasting, but his battling with the devil is sort of like for St. Athanasius, he's the high command. We're the infantry. Right. We were able to conquer the heresy right, right. because of the way he conquered the yeah, devil. I, I think it's beautiful to think also, you know, the, this, uh, the Catholic idea of spiritual warfare, the fathers understood heresy 100% as spiritual warfare. Right. Right. Yeah. right. And they would say that. And, and even yeah, Mary, when she appears to Dominic, says, conquer through this, right, right. the rosary. And it was the heresy. Well, let, let's not forget uh, the supremely instructive example, which I think antedates the fourth century, and that's Jesus. I mean, he wrestles with the devil for 40 days in the desert, and that sort of suggests that uh, the prince of this world uh, is pretty much in charge, disposing of these empires. And he says to Jesus, in effect, look, just bow down and I'll give you, you everything. Yeah, right. I've always thought that that was funny, you know, because obviously he did a good job in those 2,000 years from the fall until then. He had all the kingdoms of the world in his hand. Yeah. And I love, I, the reason I love the idea of St. Anthony of the desert and Jesus going out into the desert is because people think that we're on the defense. But that's quite the opposite, right? St. Anthony went out specifically because he wanted to be on the offense. He was going out into the home of the devil to say, you and me, you know, we're going we're gonna to get this over with. It's imperative that we, and I think that's a really good point, Dave, is that we're aware of that. It, it goes back to your, Scott, your point earlier, Scott, about there's no neutrality in this. Right. And, and if we're always in the defense, running away, hiding, then we become more of a target. We become right. more we do. helpless, Certainly. if you will. Yeah. This illusion of religious neutrality is ironically itself a kind of diabolical deception. Yeah, totally, absolutely. You know, and once you expose that, yeah. you're yeah. also kind of already now engaged in the warfare right. Right. by exposing yeah. it. Yeah, Lewis uh, has a great line. Uh, Christianity, he says, is the story of the righteous king right. who sort of secretly in disguise returns to his kingdom, which right. has been deposed by the evil one and wants to enlist his friends in committing acts of sabotage right. against uh, this dark Lord. So it's a warfare. Right, yeah, we're I mean, we're called to be engaged before we think the devil's engaging us. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's, that's the, we, we really need to reclaim that. And isn't that's that, a desperate plea. Isn't you know? that one of the main things that you're doing, Dave, is, is just that is trying to raise the consciousness of, you know, the, I would assume mostly Catholics that you're dealing with, just help them understand that basic fundamental reality. Absolutely. The last thing I'll say in these events that I do is, you know, get, get involved tomorrow. Do something tomorrow to win the battle for your family, win the battle for your own soul, win the battle for our culture at large that's, you know, floundering, yeah, yeah. And, and to really engage because there's no, no neutral ground, right? There's no, no chance you're gonna be able to just sit back and- Can we maybe just take one step back? Just because I think it's important is, we use words spiritual warfare, engage and all that. Can you help the viewer, help us see what does that actually look like? I mean, how is the evil one infiltrating and how is he affecting? I mean, I think we're just clueless to that most basic fundamental reality. So what would be some really practical I mean, the, things that he's doing? Right, the most basic thing that we see is temptation, right? That he's gonna tempt us. And I, I always say that the, the very first thing the devil tries to do is mess with how we view God and how we think God views us, right? That's a big thing. And that's why heresies are seen as a big part of spiritual warfare right. because it messes with who Jesus is, right? And, or uh, how we see ourselves. Or how we see ourselves, right. And that's and, what he did in the devil. Exactly. I mean, he did in the Garden of Eden. Exactly. So did God say he knows that you will be like him right. and all of right. that? Right. right. So, so in, in a certain sense, you know, to engage in a daily spiritual battle, you're trying to build the kingdom through faith and through knowledge, through moral living, meaning that you're reclaiming some of that ground that the world and the flesh and the devil have taken, that you've grown soft in, and then through communion with Jesus Christ, I, really first through communion with Jesus Christ, through prayer. Prayer is the work of spiritual work. Yeah. You know, the devotions that we practice can lead to devotionalism. Sure. But in fact, if we do them with a kind of humble intentionality, the scapular, the rosary, holy water, consecration to Our Lady, 
as well as to St. Joseph, the terror of demons. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have to understand all of the operations of the devil, or even most of them. What we need to understand are these things that Christ has given us that are instruments of the Holy Spirit. They don't necessarily, just waving a rosary, yeah. no, but praying it and contemplating the mysteries. Right. You know, an iron bar won't set a fire, but if you put it in the fire long enough, it glows red oh. hot yeah. and can transmit that. And I think we can become like that, transmitters of this mm -hmm. divine power. I, th I think that's another reason why there's importance to a Catholic understanding of spiritual warfare. Amen. The devil hates physical manifestations of grace. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. the, the beads going through the right. hands, the right. enthronement of the sacred heart, right. the epiphany blessing. The devil despises yeah. things yeah. like that. Sacramentals, you know, that show, it shows water. those yeah, things. Right. And when used, when used in faith, right. right. When used in faith, they are powerful yeah. weapons against evil. And that's the beauty of Catholicism, that it, it respects our humanity. But, but why is he so attractive uh, to so many? Why, why the fascination? I mean, I, I've had students uh, uh, read Dante, but they can't get beyond the Inferno because it's just so electrifying. Yeah. They're not interested in the Paradiso. That's boring <laughs> stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. And, and Milton's uh, Satan is a pretty attractive guy. Sure. Why is it that sanctity is not all that appealing? Right. Yeah. Well, well, sanctity, well first of all, sanctity is hard, right? Yeah. But I think, I think one of the reasons that, one of the things is that we don't talk about the devil enough, so it still has that kind of uh, mystique to it. I see. And people are, you know, for, afraid of it. And they do think, you know, the problem with this topic is that when people hear of the devil, they don't think they're being affected by the devil in their daily life. They think of exorcism. Right. Exactly. right? And we and have to really break that and right. say, look, no, the devil's a part of the life of every Catholic, unfortunately. So it's not just demonic possession, there is an element of demonic oppression, but there's also a great deal of demonic influence right. that might seem kind of low key. And I mean, that's a superficial taxonomy, but it helps us to realize that even if there's no sign of possession, that doesn't mean that we're not on the battlefield. And of course. I think that's what's so important is that some people have this idea, of if, if your head isn't spinning around, that you're not being right. influenced. You're, you're, everybody <laughs> right. is being influenced. And, and I would suggest to your point that one of the reasons that it's that sanctity isn't as attractive is that I don't know that people are seeing it enough. Right. You know, I think when people really see somebody in love with the Lord, living in life that's animated yeah. by God and His grace, that is unbelievably attractive. And we will have more to talk about after we take a break. So stay with us. We'll be back with Franciscan University Presents in just a couple of minutes. When the church asks publicly and authoritatively in the name of Jesus Christ that a person or object be protected against the power of the evil one and withdrawn from his dominion, it is called exorcism. In a simple form, exorcism is performed at the celebration of baptism. The solemn exorcism, called a major exorcism, can be performed only by a priest and with the permission of the bishop. Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 1673. You don't have to trade top flight academic programs for a passionately Catholic identity. You can have both. At Franciscan University of Steubenville, you'll not only deepen your faith, you'll be prepared for real world success by dedicated professors for whom excellence isn't just a goal, but the standard. Ready to get started? Check out franciscan.edu. Welcome back and thank you. You're watching Franciscan University Presents and we're coming to you from our communication arts studio here on the campus of Franciscan University of Steubenville. Our students are operating the cameras, the equipment, uh, they're doing a great job for us. We're also joined by Dr. Regis Martin, our faculty, Dr. Scott Hahn, and our special guest, our special guest is Mr. Dave Van Vickel. Uh, Mr. Van Vickel is a uh, speaker, travels all around the country. He's also a ministry, uh, involved in the Ministry of Evangelization in Pittsburgh. And he's just an expert on our topic today about spiritual warfare. One of the things that's been really evident, Dave, is that everybody is in this battle. So what advice would you give to yeah, the moms and the dads who have families? And, and first off, we don't want people to be f afraid, right? There's right. nothing to be afraid right. of here. Of course not, right? no. So when people, okay. No, I, I, I always use this analogy. And um, I, I remember one time I was on a, a sheep farm and uh, I'm yeah, sure I, 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 I was noticing, you know, how skittish and scared these sheep were and how 
when the shepherd, it was a small farm, would come out, it was like a, a peace would settle over the whole flock, you know. And I always tell people that that's how to know whether to be afraid of the devil. Because if you look to the scriptures, there's conflicting evidence. Should we be afraid? Should we not be afraid? At one point, Jesus says, I'll give you the full force to tread over the power yeah. of the enemy. At one point, he says, be careful of the one who can kill both body and soul, right? Right. Uh, but if we have that kind of intimacy with our shepherd, with Jesus, then of course we shouldn't be afraid. If we know his voice, his walk, his smell, if we know the way he moves, right. of course we shouldn't be afraid. And in fact, in that case, the devil's very afraid of us. And also the fact that the church has given us tools to conquer in a very real way. What are some of those? Well, obviously, you know, the classical tools are prayer and fasting, right? Prayer and fasting are the two things that Jesus says some demons can only come out through right. prayer and fasting. And that's something that we need to kind of revisit in the church. We don't talk that often about fasting. People usually just associate it with Good Friday now. But regularly fasting is a massive blow to the world of evil because it kind of helps us to focus, right? Fasting is like a physical retreat in a sense. Sure. It helps us to focus on God. Uh, the, the other way is, you know, devotions to Our Lady. Our Lady plays a guaranteed role in every spiritual battle. When God proclaims to Eve, right, that uh, a woman's coming, right, and yeah. her offspring will crush the serpent, he guarantees Mary's role in every spiritual battle. So praying the daily rosary, doing consecrations to Mary, prayers to Mary is a very powerful thing in the battle against evil. I just recently had a student in my office and she was sharing about that and she and her, her brother were dealing with some uh, situations that they're having bad dreams mm -hmm. and was told to hold a rosary and mm -hmm. embrace a rosary when they're going to bed and there's just a presence of, of Our Lady of our intercession for us, right? Yeah, absolutely. Our, our Lady, uh, particularly consecrations to Our Lady, the devil, he can't work with people who love Our Lady. Yeah. He can't yeah, work with yeah, people. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was thinking of how many parents might be watching and how we have to take that responsibility. You know, a practice that we have done in my home now for decades is a morning and an evening blessing where we gather in what we call the family huddle. And if I'm not there, Kimberly does this. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you, Michael, Gabriel, Hannah, Jeremiah, Joseph, and David, today and forever, <laughs> to in heaven together. Amen. And, and now I get to see them doing it with our 18 grandkids in the morning and the evening. And that it isn't just psychic comfort, you know, there really is a sense in which you're exercising the authority that you possess as priest, prophet, and king in a domestic church. And so we do that not in competition with the priest because the parish is a family too, right. but the natural family is a spiritual and a sacramental organism. And we have access to the sacramental authority of Christ in union and in subordination to the priest. But again, it's a collaborative sort of thing. And so I would say to parents especially, don't give in to the fear that paralyzes. You know, but at the same time, don't just dabble in the demonic. That's like poking a hornet's nest. Sure. You know, you're gonna get stung and hurt and all of that. But don't be stupid, don't be paralyzed, you know, but be aware and beware. But at the same time, the greater is he that is within you, right, the Holy right. Spirit, than he that is within the world. And I think part of that is, is I as a priest, there's an awareness in me and my ministry that in one sense, I stand in the gap for the people that I'm called Amen. to minister to. And, and, and I take that very seriously. That's why, you know, prayer, you, you mentioned Our Lady. One of the greatest blessings for me in spiritual warfare was the demonstrate consecration that I right. did years ago. And honestly, it surprised me how tangible that was, that there was a lived change in my life because of that. Now, I continue to do that. I continue to do the, the consecration just about every year, um, the short prayer. But I see myself as doing that for the people. Now for the students here, the yeah, faculty and staff right. here at Francis University. I love the image of parents doing that for their kids, that, that you stand in the gap right, for your yeah. children. This, that's, that's, that's a, a beautiful image. That, that's a lovely uh, uh, metaphor. And the one that uh, uh, you uh, uh, improvised about uh, this network of grace that envelops uh, yourself and your children. And it's sort of a custom that has grown up and surrounds and permeates uh, your, your own domestic church. Uh, I'm really impressed by that, but I'm wondering how widespread is that? It's certainly not fashionable. How many people really think the job of the priest is to stand in the gap? I mean, I think they tend to be sort of Pickwickian. There is no gap. Nobody needs to stand anywhere. Right, right. I mean, I haven't, I have often heard perfectly awful sermons in which <laughs> sin is denied, uh, not just by Jesuits, but by <laughs> non-Jesuits. So don't get uptight. You don't worry about sin because you seldom commit one. 
and, and they go on to say that if there's a devil, he's just a principle of generalized evil. And, and uh, I think that's, he's not a person. And I think that's one of the things you've mentioned, Dave, is, is the number one way we overcome evil, the evil one, this battle, is by a life of holiness, by a life of virtue. And part of that is a recognition of our sin and rooting that out of our own life. Right. And I, I, think, I think all these things, like blessing your children, consecration to Mary, which is extremely powerful, it, they're all really important. But what I would suggest is that if the most aggressive thing we can do to the kingdom of evil is evangelize. Mm -hmm. It's the most aggressive form of spiritual warfare. Because we're taking away his Because we are space, going into right, er right, territory that right. he owns. And so I think it's important that uh, you obviously are evangelizing your children. And what we want to tell people is that, yeah, bless your children, but evangelize them, right? Sure, evangelize right. your children and evangelize your neighbors. And then, and then you know you have recourse. When the devil strikes back, you have no you have recourse yeah. to, to fight but, back. Uh, you know, practical things, you know, it's like, how do you defeat the devil? Well, how do you eat an elephant? Small bites, you sure. know. Sure. So many small steps. And you mentioned the Marian consecration. Sure. We did that as a family. And again, the, the difference tangible. was tangible. Absolutely. It is. Palpable. It is. You know, when we also found out about the influence of Freemasonry, without getting paranoid, we mm -hmm. got a long prayer and walked each of our kids through it because we realized that we had a really dark depression that went back at least three or four generations in my side of the family with suicide and that sort of thing. And so, you know, we, we spent an hour going through this prayer and we did it one more time a few years later. And another episode, I remember when my son was entering into a depression, I won't say which one, but he was living far off, you know, and uh, we usually, you know, we could connect, I could bless him, we could pray together. But so I began fasting. You know, and it was a systematic thing. It wasn't like looking in the mirror and saying, I'm holy, I'm unholy, but he needs me. And so, sure, sure. you know, who needs breakfast and lunch, you know? And uh, he told me months later, you won't believe what a difference it yeah, made. Sure. Yeah, sure. I know that on many occasions, people who have been suffering severely from evil uh, manifestations, and they've gone from deliverance minister to deliverance minister and prayer person to prayer person and priest to priest, and they haven't gotten any help that very often the case is yeah. if I sit with them and do the Marian consecration, right. that's the case. I was right. really struck by that uh, illustration uh, you cited of working on a sheep farm. Yeah, sure. Uh, that, that was uh, impressive because it, it gives us the image of the Good Shepherd right. uh, uh, who cares for the sheep uh, and wants to spare them from becoming lamb chops right. Uh, right. For, for the evil one. But at the same time, he's not simply mild and gentle sure. uh, and forbearing. He's also a mighty warrior. Right. I mean, you can't appreciate Scripture without Satan. I mean, the two sort of go together, but they're not equal. Right. But if you don't have Satan, there's no drama, there's no story, <laughs> right. there's no conflict, yeah. there's no victory. Right. Yeah. right, and I think we experience that I, ideally every time we go to the Eucharist as well, that, that we're able to enter into this, this union, this relationship with the Lord that again continues, each one of those opportunities continues to bring our heart back. Our, our heart is, is grasped and, and encountered by the Lord every time that brings us back. Right, Christ bought his victory at Calvary. Right. And so when we go to communion, we're receiving Calvary again. Right? Right? We're, yeah. we're, it's becoming present to us once again. And so it's the most powerful way. And, and demons despise the hands of the priests. They talk about it often, the hands of the yeah. priests, because this is where we get Jesus. Yeah. They also talk about uh, confession. You know, they hate the box. I the see. box. You know, there's no place you hear or read more about spiritual combat than the visions of John and the Apocalypse, right. you know. Right. And I remember reading this as a Protestant in an accelerated Greek course where I had to translate all 22 chapters and not really being able to make much sense of what is going on or how is the devil defeated. I know the end, he loses, we win, all of that. Right. But it was only by going to Mass my first time as a Protestant, as a, a journalistic observer, that I began to see all of the connections and to connect all of the dots because the only thing you find on every page of the apocalypse is the liturgy right, right, right. that the angels and saints are celebrating but it corresponds exactly to what we're doing in the mass and that is the context in which the devil is defeated that the devil is cast out of heaven at the midpoint of these visions but it really is a heavenly liturgy that we are plugged into whether i believed it or not whether i even knew about it or reality, not right. this was the reality and so, okay, it's doctrinally true, and heresy is a kind of diabolical cancer in the body of Christ, but we've got to take the truth into the realm of power. 
And that power then manifests the goodness of God. So, you know, intellectual understanding is so crucial to grasp the truth. Sure. But to stop there and not move to head, from head to heart is just like, well, isn't that the sin of Lucifer? You know, it's the swollen intellect, that pride that I know, right. but I don't love. Right. You know, and so I just think loving our kids, loving our Lord, Absolutely. our Lady, all of this right. Right. is entering into yeah. a power. Right. You remember the, the garrison demoniac after he's healed. Right. Jesus says, go back to your family. Go back to your right. family. That's a beautiful thing, right? That the, when people are healed from these severe, severe attachments to so evil, simple. we have to love them. We just love them, love them. Right. Right. If, if he's the father of lies, then uh, what we need to do is stand with the truth. Sure. Right. Uh, right. And, and the truth is we belong to God. He's, he owns us. He's died for us uh, and, and purchased us at a pretty high price. I mean, that, that knowledge, I think, is very freeing. Of course. I think, you know, going back to a comment you made, it's kind of like I've been thinking about this the whole time about the fact that at the fall we made uh, a covenant with death. You know, I think that's really why the demons hate confession so much as well. Because, right, because it's, it's, break, right, it's restoring that. It's right. restoring that. And in a sense, it's the opposite of what the devil did after the fall, right? He tells him, oh, you're naked, clothe yourselves. And what do you do in the confessional? You expose yourself, right, right in right. a certain sense, right? You say, I, I, this is who I am, God. This is who I, you know, you have to, you have to clean me. Right, right. Uh, and I think that but that's I love why that, they hate just it. that image in, in Genesis, the Lord says, oh, where are you? Where are you? You know, in that, that the Lord is continually looking for us to bring right. us back to himself. And in confession, we say, here, here right, I am. Right. And the yes. covenant with death is not just a covenant with physical death, but right. spiritual death. Right. And the Lord said, the day you eat of it, you'll surely die. It wasn't a vain or idle threat. The day they ate it, they committed mortal sin and they snuffed out the life of God in their soul. That is not less of a death than if the serpent had bit them. Right. That right. is the deepest right. and darkest kind of death. Right. Right. That's the covenant point. with death. Be afraid of the one who can destroy Do both. Soul. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. And that's one of the beautiful things is that we go to the Eucharist, we receive uh, the sacrament of the Eucharist, we receive confession, and this is restored. This life of grace is restored to us once again. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important that these, these really practical things that allows, I know here at Franciscan University, one of the things we do is we begin the semester throughout the whole, I, I don't know how many gallons of holy water we use, just right. blessing, claiming this, right. this, this land is holy, right? The, the RDs and the RAs in the evening, they bless all of the dorms, is, is again, standing on behalf of, of their students, of their peers. And those concrete, practical things are important. Right. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what the devil does when you do that? I mean, they, the oh. demons would despise well, this. So it, this, it's summer, this summer, yeah. one of the things I did is, is after the conferences I invited, I said, just go pray over my campus. You know, this yeah. is, this, I claim this as our own. Well, we had about 35 Dominican sisters. Well, I tell you, yeah, can they, you they went after it. And they, and <laughs> they gave me a little map with a red mark over every place they prayed a rosary on our campus. Yeah. And it's just covered. And oh, there is a grace and, and a power that goes with that. It claimed this because it's been given to us by Christ and we can claim it as our it's own. It's beautiful when you see people take it for their own, when they right. realize Absolutely. that. My children. And every baptized has that. Right. Yeah. And my children, it's like, I love it. You know, they have a, they have a bad dream. We'll see them come out and they'll get one of our relics That's that right. we have from the exorcism and they'll go back. They won't even say anything like, Daddy, what do we do? It's normal. Yeah. <laughs> so up next, our panel and our guests will have final thoughts on today's topic. Stay with us. Satan, or the devil, and the other demons are fallen angels who have freely refused to serve God and his plan. Their choice against God is definitive. They try to associate man in their revolt against God. Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 414. The power of Satan is nonetheless not infinite. He is only a creature, powerful from the fact that he is pure spirit, but still a creature. He cannot prevent the building up of God's reign. Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 395. The coming of God's kingdom means the defeat of Satan's. Jesus' exorcisms free some individuals from the domination of demons. They anticipate Jesus' great victory over the ruler of this world. The kingdom of God will be definitively established through Christ's cross. God reigned from the wood. Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 550. Welcome 
Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We've come to our final segment. Regis, could you start us off with your final thoughts? Right, yeah, I have a number of uh, thoughts, but uh, one in particular is a sense of dismay uh, about uh, uh, current practice. Very few people go to confession, right. uh, and so we're not surprised, are we, that with uh, uh, the diminishment of the line waiting to be shriven, there should be this increase uh, in uh, satanic activity. Uh, but I don't know that uh, our Lord's spiritual have picked up on that, but that, that may be for uh, another show. But speaking of Lord's spiritual, I'm reminded of uh, advice, catechetical advice that uh, St. Cyril of Jerusalem gave back in the fourth century, this wonderful metaphor. The dragon, uh, he says, uh, sits by the side of the road waiting for people to pass. We go to the Father of souls, but we must first pass by the dragon. And there he is, you know, poised uh, to attack. Uh, and Flannery O'Connor used that text uh, to adorn her first collection of short stories, nine stories about original sin. And stories of pith and moment are really about that encounter, the confrontation with the evil one. Either he swallows you up, devours you, or with the grace of God, you get by, you escape, one or the other, and that's what makes stories uh, uh, dramatic. Uh, Pope Paul, now Saint Paul, was, was I think tormented uh, in his last years, uh, and he smelled uh, the stench uh, of, uh, of Satan even in the temple of God, and he pronounced the devil to be the uh, malicious seducer. Uh, he is the principal uh, agent responsible for evil in the world. And it tells you something. If people don't believe in him, then they're doing his bidding. Right. They're doing his work without quite knowing it. Right. And that's a great sadness. Right. Right. Thank you, Regis. Scott. No, first I want to say thank God for what John Paul did in the late 90s, not only by restoring the right and encouraging every diocese, but really setting into motion the kinds of things that we now can see years later. Is it enough? I don't think so but it's so much more than what we had before. You know, and I would say as, again, a parent, I have that concern. I've had raised six kids, five sons, one daughter, I say one rose and five thorns, and I had a deal with them. They knew I went to confession every week. I didn't tell them why, but I mean, they knew I'm a sinner, I'm a weakling, and I need that grace. I had a deal, no, you don't have to ever tell me why, but any time of morning, noon, or night, say, I need a, I need a ride. You know, I'll drop you out. We'll call, and I'll, you know, no questions. You know, and I just think that the, um, but at the same time, I want to say that holy water, you know, Marian consecration, regular confession, but we also found good Catholic counselors for our kids right, right. because we don't just automatically default to demonic possession. Right. You know, and yet one of the Catholic counselors also used holy water, sure. and she sure. gave me some really sound advice on how to engage more effectively in spiritual warfare, short of exorcism, you know, but you don't have to wait till heads are spinning and people are speaking Latin in languages they haven't learned to consult your priest and maybe the bishop and just say, you know, how do I discern whether it is or it isn't, you know? But there's so many steps along the way that we can take without just simply lunging for an exorcism like the TV or like the movie. You know? right, that's great, right. that's great, thanks, Scott. I, I think the, the, the thing we need to take away is that there's so much hope, right? I mean, we, we have the victory. It's, it's given to us through the church, and, and Christ gave his bride his victory, right, almost as a wedding present. And the more we enter into that church, the more we enter into Christ, the more that victory becomes real in our life. And I think for so many people out there, they're just wondering, what can I do today? And I think those things are, are very simple. First of all, we need to start advancing the kingdom of heaven, meaning we need to start evangelizing. Catholics are not good at this. Yeah. Yeah. Take it out and, and go out and claim territory that's been, that's been reclaimed by Satan, right? And, and to evangelize and to love, 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 right? We build the kingdom through evangelization and works of mercy. But then in your own spirit, in your own life, uh, reading scripture, praying each and every day, subjecting your mind to Christ, there's so many lies out there that the devil is spreading and scripture is gonna fix all that. And, our, and turning with recourse to Our Lady. Our Lady is desperate to get involved in the battles of our life. She loves 
to tussle with, with the right. evil one because she knows she has the full authority and the full victory uh, to, to be able to, to do what she needs to do to save her, her children. So please don't feel hopeless at all, yeah. Uh, yeah. right? But well, Dave, actually, it's funny. You took my word. Is that there's a way I think that we can talk about this and almost like this weight. That it should not be that. That that it is a victory, and that we ought to be filled with hope in the eye of, of course. This. That it, it's not an overwhelming. It's not a what am I going to do. It's it's now I know where I to, where I'm to turn, where I'm right. going to get my victory, where I'm going to get the hope. So I think that that's just a beautiful word to finish off on. I, I had an encounter one time when I was in Africa, and I was dealing with a bishop. And the bishop said that he didn't uh, allow his men to be ordained until they could speak to an encounter with the Holy Spirit that transformed them. And he said something interesting. He said, why would I ask them to do the work of Jesus if they don't have the power of Jesus? Mm -hmm. And, and that this power comes from the Holy Spirit. And I think it's one of the things that's imperative in this discussion is that we're aware that, that Jesus, I love the beginning of Acts, that you will receive the Holy Spirit and empower, power to be able to witness to my name. That power is is key in this whole discussion, that, that we're trying to enter into battle. We just don't, we don't have the power, we don't have the weapons. We're literally going in there naked and just getting shot. And the reality is, is this particular battle, it's for our soul. Right. And there is no second place here. We right. either win or right. we lose, right? And, yeah. then, and as you've said, stated several times, Regis, that that this, this battle is ultimately going to determine whether or not we go to heaven yeah. or whether or not we go to hell. And to be aware of that and to realize that Christ himself has given his very spirit to empower. The same spirit that anointed and animated Jesus anoints me, anoints us. We receive that in baptism. And to be able to claim that, to be able to stand on that. And that's not all. The sacraments, sacramentals, Our Lady, the saints. The one thing I think that's also important is, is this. It, it's relationship. It, right. it's, it's fellowship. My experience is one of the things the evil one wants to do is he wants to keep us in the dark. And if we're not willing to talk about struggle, if we're not willing to talk about temptation, you mentioned an illusion that something happened in the past of your family. If, if, if we don't want to talk about that stuff, the evil one has us exactly where he wants us. Mm -hmm. But if we can allow the light of grace to animate us, we begin to share with our brothers and sisters, there is a profound freedom that comes with just admitting to be able to look at this, to bring it into the light. So thank you so much, Dave, for being with us, just to help us uh, be enlightened about this topic. One of the things that we would like to offer you is this handout, which is dealing with today's topic. It's free and it's available as a resource for a Catholic understanding about spiritual warfare. Uh, Dave has just done a great amount of work in this and we're very grateful for it. This handout is yours for free by simply going online to faithandreason.com or by calling the number you'll see on the screen in just a moment. I just want to thank you very much for enlightening us and allowing us to recognize, yes, that we're in the midst of a battle, but that battle has been won. So there ought to be no despair, no fear. The reality is what God has given us. It gives us everything we need to be able to be victorious in this. Amen? Amen. Amen. We just ask uh, the Lord would pour out his blessings upon you and fill you with his grace that you would know the power and the freedom that comes with Jesus and being in relationship with he and the church. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. To download the free handout on today's topic, go to faithandreason.com. Email your request for the handout to presents at franciscan.edu. At faithandreason.com, you can also purchase past episodes of Franciscan University Presents or request today's free handout and purchase past programs by calling 888-333-0381. That's 888-333-0381 or call 740 283-6357.